without the introduction to almost nothing, um, uh, simply to welcome you all to, uh, uh, to this event, uh, to remind you that we will have another event on the 28th of April uh, at 1.30 for an hour uh, on lightning, with, which will be lightning talks, and I'll mention that again at the end, uh, to say that there will be a feedback form link coming at the end as well, so uh, it'd be great if you can, um, if, if you can give us feedback. Uh, and to welcome our speaker for the day. This is a bit of a first for Warren, because this, this is the first time that we inv have invited somebody to facilitate an event from right outside the OR community, uh, somebody who's a specialist in, uh, in uh, equality and inclusion. I'm delighted to be joined today by Debbie Rochelle uh, from the Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion. Debbie specialized in diversity and inclusion for the last 12 or 13 years. And before that, she worked in HR, she's the HR manager, HR director in Marks and Spencers and other places. Um, so she's, uh, she's got a huge amount of experience which she's going to be sharing with us. Um, she was brought into uh, ENEI it, to, to develop their diversity and inclusion product or activities. Um, so she's been with them for a very long time working on these issues. And without further ado, I will hand over to Debbie um, to, to take us through this really dear to my heart issue. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks a lot, Ruth. And, uh, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so we're going to be looking today at how we can challenge everyday sexism at work. Um, uh, Ruth has come through a really good introduction to me, so thank you. So I won't um, spend any time doing that, but just a little bit about ENEI. So the Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion are a membership organisation, and we support organisations across the UK and um, actually globally now to become more inclusive. Our members represent about 25% um, of the UK workforce. So we We've got quite broad um, impact and, and representation. Um, so um, what are we trying to do today? Really, we are going to raise awareness of the impact of casual sexism on people and on the organisations that we work for and that we are part of. We'll identify some of the key areas at work where casual sexism can happen. Um, and we'll understand how we can challenge casual sexism. What's the best way to do it? And what is preventing some people from speaking up? And then we are going to commit to change. Just a few notes. So if you're happy to have your cameras on, as most of you do, then that's great. Um, please can you mute your microphone until you are speaking? I think everyone's already done that. Um, but there will be opportunities for questions throughout. And at that point, please feel free to unmute. Um, the session is quite interactive, but we have quite a lot to get through. So there will be time for questions at certain key points as we go throughout. This is a safe space to discuss um, difference. Um, therefore, it needs to be confidential and anything that anyone shares with you today, I'd like you to respect their confidentiality by not passing that on. And today is about creating understanding. It's about learning. It's not about blaming. It's not about shaming. Um, it is just about us all um, learning together. So let's just start with a quick reminder of what we mean by sex equality. So it's the state of equal access to resources and opportunities, regardless of sex. It includes economic participation, equality in employment, equality in pay, equality in decision making. And it also involves giving equal importance to valuing the different behaviours, aspirations, needs and experiences of people, regardless of the sex that they, um, that they have. So this is different to the protection that we get under legislation in the UK. So much broader. So in the UK, the Equality Act protects people from discrimination on the basis of sex. This legislation has been in place since 2010, um, but we've actually had some legislation in the UK um, since um, 1975. So I... You're breaking up, Debbie. Uh... So if you go back to what you were saying at 1975 and try again, or is it me? Same for me, Ruth. No, okay. Yeah, I think Debbie might have frozen. 
Okay. Okay, let me... No, there you are. I can hear you again now. I can... That's great. Okay. Thanks for pointing that. Please let me know if there's a problem again. Um, so we've had legislation for nearly 50 years now, so there shouldn't be any sexual discrimination, but we... Oh, no. Stuck again. And gone. That's, um, I'm afraid I'm not in a position to take over from the speaker here. <laughs> Actually, I am. I've got her slides uh, somewhere, but hopefully she'll be back with us in a moment. So, yeah, welcome, everybody. In Hello. There you go. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Apologies for that. I seem to have been thrown out for the summer. Okay, can you see the slides again? Uh, any minute, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, great. So we've had legislation since 1975, so there shouldn't be any sex discrimination anymore. Um, but actually there is, and we know that there is because of the experiences that people continue to report. So let's just go through some of the figures that illustrate some of this inequality. We know there's a gender pay gap. Um, in full-time employment, it's nearly 8%, uh, rises to 15.5 um, when we include all employees. We know that only 8% of CEOs in the FTSE 100 are female. Has increased, um, sorry, uh, it's higher than in the FTSE 250, but still only 8%. We know that only 13.5% of executives in the FTSE 100 are female. We know that only 34% of MPs are female, and this is reduced to only 21.7 when we look at the cabinet. A few years ago, there was an equal pay scandal in the BBC, and as a result of that, over 700 female members of staff received a pay increase, and several very high-profile members of staff took a pay cut um, to help pay for that. Um, and it doesn't make a great deal of sense, because we know that uh, female students do better at school, we know that um, there are a higher percentage of um, girls and young women um, achieving the highest grades at both GCSE and A-level. So why does it happen? There are clearly still inequalities between the sexes. Um, we know that um, people report sexist language and sexist behaviours on a regular basis. Some are serious, some are minor, some can be really offensive, some can be quite normalised, some make people feel as if they should just be able to ignore it without being able to protest. But actually, each of those things has a lasting impact on people. So we need to make sure that we stop that. And that's what we really refer to as everyday sexism. It's the casual behaviours that people experience, which reinforce a negative stereotype, put them down or cause offence. It's different to sexual harassment um, as it's rarely re raised, it's rarely reported. Um, it's rarely complained about um, because people think it's too small to make a fuss about um, and they don't want to um, put their head above the parapet. But actually, this everyday sexism has to be addressed so that it can be stopped. Um, and here are just a few examples of that. So um, I'm sure you will have heard some of these before, but women are better at organising than men. Why not? Why can't men be just as good as organising? Um, everyday sexism isn't just focused on the negative behaviours and negative stereotypes for women also has an impact on men. Being called the fairer sex, somebody pointing out the sex of an individual as if it makes a difference. So as if a, a female lawyer or a female pilot couldn't be as competent as a male one, so therefore it should be acknowledged. Or a male nurse um, or some of the other sectors where men are less likely to be represented. The comments about um, different gen different sexes, so men can't multitask or women are too sensitive. The assumptions that people might make about somebody's career, so making an assumption that somebody might want maternity leave just because they've recently got married, for example. The comments that might be made to men um, saying, aren't you great helping your wife out to look at the kids as if it's absolutely the, the um, woman's job to look after children when clearly it isn't. And the comments and the sentences that start with, I'm not sexist, but I'm sure we've all heard those before. They're usually followed by something which is demonstrating everyday sexism in some way. We 
talk about these behaviors um, quite a lot and we refer to them as microaggressions. So they're the everyday slights, indignities, put downs and insults that women and sometimes men can experience in their day-to-day -day interactions with other people. They're often subtle behaviors, can be verbal or nonverbal, could be conscious or unconscious, um, but they're directed at um, a member of a, of a marginalized group often when we're talking about sex um, women, and they usually have a derogatory or harmful effect that is linked to the protected characteristic of sex. We all send and receive these little messages um, in all of our interactions with other people. We can have positive interactions and we can have negative ones. So the negative ones result in somebody feeling excluded. So for example, who makes eye contact with others um, in a meeting? Um, and who gives a knowing look across the table to somebody else um, judging what is being said? The positive ones do the opposite effect and they help somebody feel really included. So somebody smiling at a presenter to give them some confidence that their message is being received, etc. These positive and negative behaviours um, are um, shared between us all day, but they have the effect of making people feel included or excluded in an organisation or in the context, in the environment, the place that they happen to be. And it's the cumulative experience of those positive or negative messages that makes people feel as if they belong or as if they don't. So what we're going to do is we're going to break out into um, a few breakout rooms to talk about the micro behaviors linked to sex that you've either experienced or witnessed. And I want you to think about what the impact of those micro behaviors was. How did it make you feel, whether it's directed at you or whether it's directed at somebody else? Did it make you feel good or did it make you feel bad? How long did that impact last? Is this something that you can you know, brush off? You may think about immediately and think that wasn't appropriate, but you've forgotten about by the end of the day. Or do you still think about some of the things that you might have heard, witnessed or been told in the past? Um, and what is the lasting impact? So um, we are going to break into, I think, three breakout rooms. Um, and it would be great if one person from each breakout room would take responsibility for uh, making some brief notes about the discussions that can be emailed back to Ruth at the end of the session, um, just to help to see what else can be done and what some of the future subjects that may be explored in these sessions might cover. Um, so Karen, if you could please open the breakout rooms. Um, there will be 10 minutes and I will move between the breakout rooms to listen to, to the discussions. So at the end of the 10 minutes, I will close the room and you'll be brought back into the main session. Thank you. Go, yeah, welcome back everyone. Um, Thank you for that. I um, I'm, was able to move between two of the groups um, and there were some really good um, discussions about the micro behaviors that you experienced, the things that you've witnessed in others and the impact of that. For anyone listening on the recording, um, you won't be able to um, hear that discussion for confidentiality reasons, um, but spend the time thinking yourself about um, those experiences that you may have um, witnessed or been part of. So what I want to do now is I just want to talk a little bit about the impact that this all has. We've discussed it in the groups, but what impact does it have? Um, and all of those negative behaviours um, lead to a lack of self-confidence. They can lead to feelings of self-doubt. They can lead to people feeling as if they don't belong um, and therefore have lower trust in those relationships within the organisation. That means that people won't always speak up. They won't always give a different perspective or a different opinion because they don't have the confidence um, that they will be respected ahead above the parapet. It means that people don't achieve their potential. Um, and that is a little bit about potentially a glass ceiling, but it could also be about people being moved into um, more stereotypical roles that might have an impact in longer term career. And that leads to mental health issues. Um, but really, it's just a huge waste of talent um, and uh, talent that every organisation across the world at the moment is trying to embrace, um, is, trying to, um, is trying to encourage and attract. 
Um, so for any organisation, um, the impact is negative. So where does it happen? We know that casual sexism can happen absolutely anywhere. Um, often organisations talk more about um, diversity and inclusion um, when they are thinking about recruitment, but actually this kind of casual sexism happens everywhere. It can happen in meetings. It can be about who's given the opportunity to speak first because often that person can lead a conversation and lead the direction of the rest of the discussion. It's about who gets to speak the most, who's cut off at the end, the people that may wait until the end to speak up to gain a bit more confidence before they speak up and then not have the opportunity because the time is cut short. It's about who's listened to and who's actually heard, who follows up afterwards and who says, I heard what you said and I'd like to understand that more. Let's explore it. Let's, let's do this together. It's about who's interrupted and who's spoken over. We know that research tells us that women are interrupted in meetings um, far more than men. I think it's something like eight, eight times more than men. We see it in work allocation. Who's asked to do what? Who's asked to chair those meetings? Who's asked to go to that conference? Who's asked to take a, um, a guest out to dinner after work? Who's given those opportunities to network? Um, who is asked to do what? It's about who gets the credit? Who gets the credit for that work? If you do a great piece of research, do you get the credit um, or does the credit go to another member of the team? And then it it is also there in recruitment, um, in perhaps the, the most obvious ways um, and in the ways that people tend to think about. But it, essentially, it is everywhere. It is all around us. It's also there in language. We still hear um, language which is based on stereotypes. So we still talk about a chairman or a salesman, postman, etc. cetera. Um, we still talk about um, somebody manning a desk um, things being man-made rather than human-made um, and we're still told to man up um, or you know have the balls to do something man up they're just um, comments which aren't um, aren't inclusive at all we hear the term guys to talk about a collective group of people irrespective of sex we talk about male nurses and female footballers as if that's really unusual and therefore should be highlighted because it affects competence we know that it is linked to labelling. We know that men are seen to be more assertive. Um, we know that women are seen to be more angry. We hear comments like don't be a Karen at the moment, which is something that um, essentially refers to a middle-aged woman, often a middle-aged white woman. So it brings together elements of sexism, ageism and um, racism. And we see it in job descriptions, in the language which may attract more people of a particular sex based on the job, whereas actually there is no uh, need for language to suggest um, who the potential job holder should be. It's about their competence and about their skill. So we're gonna go back into the breakout rooms and this time I want you to think about how you challenge that. So when you see it, when you hear it, when you witness it, who should be the one to challenge that sexism? What stops people from challenging it? And how do you challenge it? What is the best way to challenge it? What can we all do to make sure that this negative, casual, everyday sexism um, isn't allowed to just continue, that it isn't trivial um, and that it needs to be dealt with? So if we can open up the breakout rooms today, you'll be with the same people as the last time. Um, and once again, I'll move between the groups. I'm going to come to the groups this time that I wasn't able to last time. Again, if you're listening to the recording, you won't be able to hear the discussion, but please could you think about the questions, take the time to think about what you could do. Thank you. We'll have another 10 minutes in this breakout. Welcome back. Hello. Well, thank you again for that. I think there was a lot of really good discussion there and actually quite a lot that um, could probably have um, taken up a lot more time. I think if there was more time and perhaps it's a good opportunity to bring people together again to talk about this in the future. Um, I think quite a lot of examples um, and lots of different reasons why people haven't spoken up. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about that now. So the main reasons why people don't speak up either when they experience um, everyday sexism themselves or when they witness it um, to other people, tends to be because they're scared of not being listened to, of not being heard, 
they're scared of being ridiculed um being made to be a bit of a joke for for raising it um being made to be seen to be petty which i know is discussed in in a couple of the rooms and not taken seriously people don't want to push their head above the parapet their fear of the repercussions i know in the world of academia you often have the same line manager for quite a long time um, and the risk of um, destabilizing that relationship is a very real fear um, making things worse um, and actually seeing uh, more negative consequences of, of doing so. Um, because they have spoken up in the past and nothing has happened, so therefore there isn't the trust, there isn't the faith that it will be taken seriously and that it will be dealt with professionally. Maybe because someone's new to an organisation or because they feel as if they're quite junior and they don't feel as if their voice will be heard in quite the same way. But essentially it's often because people feel a need to fit in um and they don't want to take the risk um when i run this kind of sessions with um groups of people we tend to hear uh, women particularly quite often say that they feel grateful and lucky to have the job that they have and they don't want to risk that never once heard a man say that they feel lucky to have a job because they feel um they have often have uh, more self-belief um, and more confidence that the organization is lucky to have them um, and therefore the power dynamic is slightly different. But if you are on the receiving end of those behaviours and that everyday sexism, <coughs> excuse me, it's important to think that this isn't just about whether it's an issue for you personally. You may not be offended by something that is said, by a comment that is made, by a stereotype which is referred to. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't speak up because it's about setting what acceptable looks like for everybody else. Um, and if you have a good relationship with someone, you're perhaps in the best position to stamp out that behavior before it affects somebody else. Um, remember that many remarks are made unconsciously or unintentionally. <coughs> So where we can, we're using, we should be using the opportunity to educate people. Um, it's not about vilifying people. It's about educating them. It's about telling them what else could be said. Check it out with someone else. If you're not sure if it feels too small, too petty, um, whether it's worth taking the risk, have a word with somebody else and ask them what they think. Have the courage to speak up at the time. At later, privately, with an ally, there are a variety of different ways that we can challenge and it doesn't need to be the same every time, it doesn't need to involve speaking up in the moment. So have a think about it, if you would like some time to reflect on how that made you feel and the best approach that's absolutely fine, um, you don't always have to say something at the time. And then how do we challenge, there are so many different ways we can do it, but here are some examples of ways that um, may be a little bit more palatable for the people that you are um, giving the feedback to. So um, if we're in a group, um, perhaps if we're a man, we could say, you know, I'm wondering how it might feel to hear that as the only woman in the group so that we get people to feel, think about feelings. We could say, I'm guessing you meant that as a joke. You know, have you thought about this? Are you aware of that? Are you aware of how that could make somebody else feel? We could ask somebody to just explain more about the thinking behind what they're saying to understand exactly what the intent was um, and therefore if it is based on a stereotype give more information to be able to challenge it. We can just say I'm struggling with that remark, that comment made me feel a little bit uncomfortable and this is why. Um, be mindful of using humour. I think sometimes we're taught that the best approach is to make things into a little bit of a joke, to make it like heart, lighthearted so that it doesn't look like we're being petty and it doesn't look like we're bringing up something small. But actually, I think that can, that can have an impact in the way that it's perceived. So try not to use humour. This is a serious subject um, and we can approach it without being um, confrontational, but try not to use humour. And I would say take the risk, take the risk to explore more about why somebody has said something or to tell them how it makes you feel. Because sometimes the impact can last a really long time. Um, and I think it's worth taking that risk. So how do each of us become an ally? Firstly, we need to challenge inequality. Doing nothing is not the same as being neutral. Being neutral is making sure that we are telling people 
was a potential impact of their behaviours or their language. Don't punish or blame people. Instead, just suggest a better way to have handled that situation. It might have been better to have said this, or have you thought about the impact that could have had? Maybe if you'd said this instead, it might have been better. State your case, be responsible and be consistent. Don't only challenge behaviours with certain people. Um, so um, it's easier to perhaps challenge behaviour when it's with people that we know and um, respect greatly and know that they know and respect us greatly. Um, but actually the impact needs to be consistent amongst everyone. And then we need to support equality. We need to listen, educate ourselves, don't make assumptions. Be supportive, be confidential, and use inclusive language whenever we can. <coughs> now, uh, the, my final slide is how to be a male ally. Now, I don't think we have any um, men in the session today, um, but um, for everyone else, perhaps it's worth um, you know, perhaps sharing these thoughts with some of your male friends and colleagues. So perhaps think about how a situation might be from a woman's perspective. Be mindful of situations where there's only one of a particular um, group of people. So where there's only one woman in a meeting, uh, one woman in a, in a group. Um, don't just ask women, is everything okay? Um, because often when we're asked that question, the majority of people will just say, yes, fine, thank you. Um, it involves a little bit more probing, a bit more commitment to actually find out um, the truth. Question and challenge others. Don't expect the women to have to challenge. And this, you know, these apply to um, inappropriate behaviours uh, across all characteristics. Don't expect the person who is on the receiving end of the behaviour to challenge. If we witness it, take the opportunity to speak up. And then avoid the man um, explaining, um, which is just um, condescending and quite belittling for women. So um, as we close, um, I know that some of you may need to leave to move on to another meeting, um, but if you did have any um, questions, um, I'm happy to stay for a few minutes. Um, and Ruth, I'm gonna hand back over to you. Thanks very much, Debbie. That was a really, really interesting session. So thank you very much for leading it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the breakouts and I thought your slides are a really useful resource. So if you don't mind, if we share them, that, that, that would be great. Um, I would like to make the point because I, uh, because this is Waran, we asked Debbie to look at uh, challenging everyday sexism. It was associated with International Women's Day and hash break the bias. Uh, but of course, anything you do uh, on any isms, and that relates to the, uh, the link that Antuella has just uh, put in the chat, any isms, the same thought process, the same sort of behavior is, uh, is appropriate. So whatever we've covered today, uh, and about some of the issues um, that are really uh, common to many of us, it, it will apply uh, to so many other characteristics. So thank you very much, Debbie. Um, I will open up if anybody would like to ask any questions, uh, do unmute yourself and, and get going or put something in the chat. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you've seen the feedback form and uh, and clicked on it and can give us some evaluation and comments. Uh, but anyway, don't forget, next meeting is the 28th of April at 1.30. We're going for the third or fourth Thursday at 1.30 from now on. So that's uh, useful to remember. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.